meeting kids and knowing how our kids learn best and what their learning styles are, but also what their intelligences are. And when I walk into a classroom, it would be pretty rare not to have a teacher look through those intelligences and being able to identify. They know their kids the best. And so we could have one activity, but the way we introduce it to different groups of kids may be a little bit different. Howard Gardner's uh, multiple intelligences are something that really is fascinating, but it really um, lends a lot of credence to the way we're teaching movement skills because we often think um, there's a myth that children who are very kinesthetic in nature are hyperactive. That's not necessarily true. Those of us who need to feel it and touch it and do it to learn it are kinesthetic learners. But we also have other kinds of intelligences that we often see parallel many temperaments. Uh, we have kids who are word smart children who like to read, children who like to pay attention to words and letters and those kinds of things and how do we build those kinds of interests into a movement setting. Uh, some things we talk about in our workshops are taking things like jump ropes and making them into words, making them into letters. Uh, when you're three years old and you're bending over, stretching, and you're down on the floor making your jump rope into a number, that's a great strength activity too. So it, I build that into orientation when we talk about the loop model that children making signs with their uh, jump ropes is one way. Um, children that can use chalk, using chalk outside is a fabulous activity. It's, it builds in orientation skills, it builds in strength types of things as kids are crawling around and making shapes. So kids who are word smart, I think that there are ways that we can recite our alphabet. Children who like numbers, children who like words, there are ways we can build those things into physical activity and capture their interest instead of we're just going to go out and play with chalk we're going to have an objective that will kind of hit those kids. Um, we have children who like music, children, and we have children who don't like music. So we have to be real careful with that one. But playing instruments, um, having parades, using different types of music in the classroom is very, very important for some children because they like those kinds of things. Some children really enjoy the feel of the grass and the stones and the leaves and all of those kinds of things. Children who really enjoy counting, who love math, um, movement skills and motor development is great for this because they really enjoy sequencing. Um, when we look at object control skills and we have different colored balls or we can organize um, and place all the colors together, we can count them, we can line them up, we can take bean bags and place them in groups of twos and threes, uh, we can take jump ropes, we can find space with chalk. That So children who really enjoy math and really enjoy reasoning and like sequencing and grouping and counting, there are lots of opportunities to do those kinds of things. Then there are children who just are spatially oriented, that like the large movements. They have a real good handle. When we watch children on the playground move, um, often teachers will say, watch that child move. They just have control of their body, and their body in space is something, um, something really fun to watch. So we get them on tricycles. We get them challenged with different balancing activities. Intentional planning for gross motor activity is really important and part of it comes back to um, teachers, classroom teachers I think, not having a lot of background and um, a lot of time in their preparation to become preschool teachers, early childhood specialists with motor development. Those fundamental skills are the ones that the myth really is that those just develop like all of these other skills. And truly what has to happen is there has to be intentional teaching. We see that if kids are not taught certain skills, um, that they won't learn those skills. And so for teachers, it's not, there's no blame. It's just that it's that intentional part of thinking about taking time to teach the skills. So when teachers are with kids during that designated time, there are so many things that we could be working on. And part of it is to be objective driven, that intentionality of saying, I have these certain skills that I know children should learn between the ages of three and five. Those skills I'm going to take five or ten minutes every designated activity time a day 
and build in that motor development time. But that intentional teaching does have to take place or children will not learn those skills. If they don't learn those, then the activity starts to wane as they get older. Children who use wheelchairs, certainly we want to focus on their upper body strength. Um, keeping kids functional in their upper body um, if they do have use of their upper body. So for a child who uses a chair that may be very involved with spina bifida, a child that uses a chair that may have any form of cerebral palsy, um, we want to keep those limbs in that upper body and the lower body if we can as functional as possible. So lots of range of motion kinds of activities, taking balls, bean bags, and those kinds of things and moving them across um, uh, across the midline, moving them forward, moving them backward, um, using, and for young children, many of those kinds of activities are also strength activities. So the focus on strength and the focus on range of motion would be the objectives. Um, the modifications would just be how heavy, how light, what kind of texture. Um, the other important thing for a child who uses a chair, if their chair is a manual chair, it's very important that they have the strength to be able to manipulate that chair on their own. And although during the preschool and early elementary, it's so much fun to push our friends in our chairs, our friends need to learn to use their chairs by themselves. And that's part of the functionality and the strength of being able to manipulate their own chair. For children that have balance um, difficulties, we really want to work on their spatial orientation. Um, one of the last things we want to resort to is having a child walk on a balance beam. That's somewhat self-defeating. Um, we often think, gosh, the first thing we should do is get on a balance beam, but we want to start a little bit bigger first. We want to take maybe some jump ropes and put them and make pathways and have children walk through those. Children with, let's say, ataxia, cerebral palsy, um, have balance issues. And some kids with visual impairments have some balance issues. We also want to work on core strength because it's the core when the body is moving that if we need to hold back or we need to go forward, Forward, it's that core area that's really going to help us control our body if we start to fall over or start to fall down. So really working on balance issues but staying away from things like a narrow balance beam and things that building things that can be challenging but that children can also be successful. Children who have verbal challenges, there are very few accommodations that really need to be made with equipment or space. What we really want to do is to challenge kids with demonstrations, having children show us the feedback because they're not going to tell us if we ask them, what did I ask you to do? We may not get that verbalization back. But children who have receptive language but not expressive, it'll just be real important that we demonstrate and that we give them the opportunity to demonstrate. Um, best practice in early childhood would suggest that children should be kinesthetic, that they should be picking up equipment and holding it and moving it and playing with it, and then we'll teach them how to use that piece of equipment. So allowing kids who are nonverbal um, to explore their environment just like all the other kids, but we may need them to demonstrate a little bit more. If we do have a classroom of children that are multi-age, three, fours, and fives together, and we have a couple three-year-olds that are just not up where the five-year-olds are, yet we need to challenge the five-year-olds, we're going to give three and four part directions, but we're going to have some little ones that can't keep up with that. So allowing children to watch other children, allowing children to shadow other kids. Um, one of the activities we do early on in a school year is learn how to shadow watch a friend and watch a friend move and make the same movements that a friend does. And it's a fun activity. It gives a lot of space awareness. But what it also does is it teaches kids that they can watch and see what other children are doing and then be able to mimic that later on. So if I give a three or four part direction to say, OK, everybody, I'd like you to run over, pick up a ball, pick up a racket, and go find a space in a hula hoop. Some little one got the ball part, and that's where it stopped, because all those balls are so pretty in lots of colors. But if they can watch and see what other kids are doing, they can catch up too. The same for kids with intellectual delays. Often, keeping up with those multi-part directions means that they have to be a rem remember to watch their friends and watch the teacher to see what the teacher is doing next.
talking with families about physical activity is, is real important. Families have a lot of competition, I call it, at home. Um, there are, uh, for some kids, it's the TV and the computer. Um, for other children, it's a multiple family dwelling uh, with very little space, uh, unsafe play areas outside. And so the challenges and the competition that families face, for some families, it's just plain time. Um, for other families, it's I need to attend to the basic needs of making sure my children are fed, that they get enough sleep, that they're well taken care of, um, to sit down and play a game or to go outside and play a game makes it very difficult. So talking with parents is, is tricky. Um, each teacher has a different setting. Each teacher has all their different families. But I think the message still is the same, that activity for young children is very, very important. If there's an opportunity to get to a place where kids can have some physical activity, which means they're out of breath, they're running, um, they're riding bikes, tricycles, playing on a playground, working on strength activities at a playground, that's great. Um, but for small spaces, things like uh, making paper balls. Paper balls are one of my favorite pieces of equipment because they, they're not going to knock things over necessarily. They can fly across a room, but sending home a little bag of paper balls and working on kicking, working on throwing, um, but working with families to help them understand why it's important that kids are moving for the same reasons that we talked about uh, a little while ago, just for the health-related physical activity and getting kids up and going. Um, many of our organizations, NASPE, the National Association for Physical Education and Sport, will talk about um, less than or not having more than 60 minutes of sedentary activity at a time. And when we think about it, when was the last time we saw a CD or a DVD that was less than an hour? And kids will sit and attend to those kinds of things. So sharing with families some ideas uh, also, because families have so many things on their minds um, when taking care of their little ones that to give them some ideas. Uh, toy lending programs are a great opportunity, putting in a little Ziploc bag or a little paper bag, some paper balls, or putting in some larger clothes and a little stopwatch and send the larger clothes home. And it's a timed activity to see how long it takes us to put those sweatpants and sweatshirt on and take those sweatpants and sweatshirt off. And then we stop the stopwatch. Um, parents can do that while they're cooking. They can do that while they're doing something else. And the kids can engage in activities. So for teachers to sit down and brainstorm about some very simple things they could send home, again, it's easier when we think about objectives. If we think about a skill we want to work on, then the brainstorming starts and it's easier to come up with activities instead of just sitting and thinking, gosh, what activity could I send home today? Um, that's pulling things out of thin air. The best way to document would be to um, have your skills and your objectives and critical elements that go with those. Uh, so for example, if we're teaching children or we're working on jumping and hopping, we know that hopping is with one foot, jumping is with two feet. And we can just document how many times we see kids do those kinds of things. The opportunity for kids to move helps them organize. It helps them make choices. Uh, it helps them organize their sequences. We think about sequencing in all of our subject areas and how we ask kids to make lists. And when they walk out in a playground and they decide first, second, third, fourth, what are they going to do? Uh, and you watch the little brains going. They, they burst through that fence and then they look and then they pick something and they go engage. So there are so many different turn taking, respect for others. Uh, watching, observing, sequencing, all of those kinds of skills. Movement just provides all of those. Then with a little bit of intentionality on a teacher's part, if there's something that she sees, she or he sees, that they want the kids to work on, movement is certainly an opportunity to do that. Um, having said that, all kids are not kinesthetic either. There are some kids who don't it doesn't feel good to move. They didn't have those opportunities when they were little. So that's where teachers really need to encourage. Those are the children, maybe from a temperament perspective, that being on that, um, on that merry-go-round that's going round and round and round with lots of kids screaming would be the last thing that they would pick. They would rather be sitting, putting some sand in a pail with a shovel quietly and just leave me alone. And so those are the times that a teacher does need to step in and try to encourage kids not to get on the merry-go-round, but to, to engage in something else. 
teachers have modeled, I think, what they've seen for years and years. And there is the feeling that it should be that physical activity, designated physical activity time should be child directed, should be all free play, and, th and that's fine, but I think we need to watch what kids are doing, and I don't know that they're selecting activity. I think spending some time once in a while to just stop, pick out a couple kids and just watch and see what really is happening during that designated time, and I, I think we'll be surprised to find out kids are more sedentary than we think. There are four basic categories of fundamental skills that we talk about, and we call it the loop model. It's locomotor, object control, orientation, and play skills. And the two O's can flip-flop back and forth. Um, so I'll go through each one, and in our, our workshops that we do, we often give some suggestions about how to incorporate these skills and how to teach these skills. These are the fundamental motor skills. These are the skills that will happen and that kids need to be taught after they walk. When children start taking their first steps, that's really their break into toddlerhood from infancy. And after that, it's these fundamental skills that need to be taught if kids are going to move up the hierarchy of being active for the rest of their lives. So locomotor skills. Locomotor skills are moving from point A to point B. Um, for some children, it's walking. Uh, for others, it's running, jumping, skipping, galloping. Uh, jumping could be a vertical jump up or it could be a horizontal jump forward. Uh, hopping, uh, we remember the difference between hopping and jumping is that hopping is one foot and jumping incorporates two feet. So we do things like moving through space. Um, it's more than just using a jump rope per se. We use our jump ropes and for example in our workshops we talk about ponies in the barn or we talk about uh, bears in the cave and kids moving from uh, using a jump rope to make a barn and they stay in their barn as a horsey and then they gallop through the, fo or through the pasture and then they come back to their barn. Um, children's movement is intermittent and so when we're working on locomotor skills moving from point A to point B, we have to remember that kids are not going to have continuous movement for a long time. Things like ponies in the barn give us an opportunity to teach the skill of galloping. So if we see children that are not just bringing their feet toward each other and galloping in a correct way, we have the opportunity to work with them and help them. For other little ones that are just moving from barn to barn to barn, so be it. They're getting their physical activity. Object control skills are those things uh, using balls or object, and they don't always have to be balls. They can be rackets, it can be uh, paper balls, all different shapes and sizes and bean bags, etc. But object control skills are throwing, catching, um, striking. Striking could start out with a very young child, start striking with their hand, and then we start to put an implement like a racket into their hand. We work on things like catching. We use light objects. If teachers are able to use balloons, those are great things to strike and to toss and to catch. Catching is a very difficult skill to teach because we know as children are very young, they start out this way with their catching, and then as they mature, their catching comes in here. But we have to have someone who can toss to them accurately to be able to catch. And when you have a class of 18, that makes it somewhat difficult. So often we'll talk about things like suspending, taking some jump ropes or some yarn or some string and suspending balloons or suspending um, some balls to a swing set or to a slide and have children bat those away and then catch them as they come back or bat them back and forth to each other without having to throw and catch that they may not have the skill yet. Um, object control skills can be difficult for children because of the hand-eye, hand-foot coordination. So we know that very young children, when we watch them run toward a ball, it very well could be that they misjudge and we see their foot come right on the top of the ball and boom, right down on their bottom they go. Um, and so we see that teaching skills sometimes means starting with it static, either the ball static or the child static, instead of dynamic, both of them moving at the same time. Orientation skills are very important skills. Uh, those are those body space awareness. Where is my body in space? Uh, children infamously love to get into a big room with a linoleum floor and run and slide on their knees across the floor or not really understanding how to stop 
very quickly. And so we see children bumping into each other and falling down. So there are some things that we can work on for body space awareness. Having kids shadow each other. As I move my hand and we move um, together and we move our feet, we may jump up, up, we may squat down, but moving each other in space and finding where our space is in relation to each other. Also working on speeds, even though children have two speeds, which is all out or nothing at all, we can work on going what is a little bit faster, a little bit faster, a little bit faster, or what is fast and slow down, a little bit slower, a little bit slower. So when teachers use those cues in the classroom also, uh, children know what they are. We talk about moving through um, pieces of material. The, the material, for example, that we sew on the bottom of sweatshirts that we buy at uh, Joanne Fabric. We take and we cut into long tubes and we have children put those over and squeeze their body all the way through. And so it's more of a tactile um, moving myself through space and feeling okay about that. There are a lot of times children will look at the uh, one of the famous pieces of equipment, the tunnel, and they'll look at that tunnel and they'll walk right around it. Um, looking at a chair, even a simple chair, and crawling under or through the chair, my body in space and where it fits into space is sometimes very difficult. And we watch kids, we see it when they go to sit down on their chairs. We see it when they come over to circle time. So working on these orientation skills of speed up, slow down, where's my body, are all skills that will translate back into the classroom as I'm waiting in line or as I'm coming over to circle time or as I'm sitting down to do a puzzle and I knock somebody else's over. Play skills are the last of the loop model and play skills really incorporate those what I call some of them the survival skills for kindergarten learning to sit on a scooter board and ride a scooter board. Uh, if preschool classrooms can have some of those either in the classroom or outside, those will definitely be pieces of equipment that children will see when they enter kindergarten and first grade in their physical education classes. So children who have a difficult time with their body in space often are the ones that we see that they go to sit down and they fall off the scooter. Before we know it, they're running over their fingers. And so exposure to things like scooters are important. The parachute is another one that most definitely is going to be one of those pieces of equipment that comes out in physical education in kindergarten and first grade. So teaching children how to use a parachute. In our workshops we talk about using, starting a little bit smaller, using pillowcases at first and popping our paper balls on pillowcases with a partner. Um, we, then we move to twin sheets, then queen sheets, then king sheets, and finally we bring out that big parachute. But inevitably one of those games that we see right away will be popcorn where all the balls are put on the parachute and the parachute goes up, the balls fly all over, and before you know it we have chaos everywhere because kids just aren't sure what the rules are when it comes to something like that. So par parachute play is another play skill. When we set up a curriculum, a motor development curriculum in preschool, we talk in our workshops about using the L-O-O-P and picking one or two of those and looping those together to say, today we're going to work on galloping and we're going to work on kicking. Those are the two motor development skills we're going to do. We're going to spend five minutes on each. We're going to come up with a little activity and we've just bought ourselves ten minutes of motor development time and skill teaching time. Often we find then that if the equipment is left out on the playground or left in the designated play area, if kids know how to use that and you've taught them a game and we put a name to it, a cute little name, they will go back and play those games and they'll organize themselves and so they'll get more practice with locomotor orientation, object control, and play skills. The activity cards are a way to start the organization and we ask teachers to keep them um, in a folder, in a notebook, and I ask teachers to organize them by the loop model. So those activities that are locomotor in nature because we've listed the skills, we know what skills we're working on, 
orientation, object control, play, and in our notebook then we can pull these activity cards in the morning when we're doing our lesson plans, however we're organizing our motor development for that day. The structure of the activity cards helps teachers be very intentional. It describes what the activity is, uh, teachers can change the name. We've come up with some names like ice cream cones or ponies in the barn, um, save the bugs. We come up with little things that have worked in the past, but teachers can look at the description and fit it to their own classroom or their own personality. On the cards, though, too, is a description. It's got the equipment. Um, there's room for notes where teachers can make notes. The kids really liked it or I modified this. Activities are only as good as they work with the kids. So sometimes it's just a matter of looking at the activity card and saying, that's a great, that just gets the juices flowing. It's not going to work with my kids the way it's written, but I know what I can do to modify it. For example, we may do ponies in the barn. For some teachers, using hula hoops is great. Other teachers are going to want to use jump ropes. Other teachers are going to say, you know what, I'm going to use chalk and let the kids draw their own barn and make their own barn. So teachers can modify back and forth. It also helps with intentionality and helps with lesson plan writing and it helps with um, talking with parents about goals, goals and objectives. Um, we have some of our objectives that are brought down from different governing bodies, our Illinois standards, um, have our objectives that we need to address in physical health and nutrition and all of the different areas. These activity cards really help us narrow in on which of the objectives are we addressing to be sure that when we're asked for either accreditation purposes or by administrators, which goals are we addressing, it's easy for us to go right to those and see. Um, and then we can also put down our benchmarks and how far we've moved. It also gives us an opportunity to make some notes about where the kids are. Um, I did this activity today, but you know what? I think all my five-year-olds and my four-year-olds have mastered that skill, so now I need to take that to a different level. So the activity cards truly help with intentionality, but they also help with organization and building in that five to ten minutes of motor development per day. I believe that if when we restructure and rethink the classroom, we could think about what can we do during circle time, in addition to maybe a CD once in a while, what kinds of things can we do for movement? Um, there are a lot of um, resources now that look at uh, yoga for young children to start out in circle time and to finish a day uh, with something like yoga, which is very, very good for kids. Um, it's relaxing, it's soothing, but it's also stretching and flexibility and strength, core strength. Um, we look at different centers in the classroom and how we could take a physical classroom setting and have one area that has opportunities for gross motor movement and focusing on some of the fundamental skills that we may talk about in a little while. There are opportunities that we can build into the classroom so kids can move. Uh, we certainly can use uh, therapy balls. Therapy balls are great for kids to roll on. I think the thing about having a structured space for gross motor is that there needs to be some intentional planning and there needs to be some intentional teaching to start out with. Or if you put a therapy ball over there and kids don't really know how to use it, all of a sudden that therapy ball will end up flying over by the puzzles or flying over by the meal time and knocking all that over. So teaching kids how to use the pieces of equipment that are there. If bean bags are set on a small space in a floor and bean bags are not to be picked up and thrown that day but bean bags are actually to be stepped on like stepping stones, we can work on balance activities. So again it's rethinking the classroom but it's also rethinking how to use some of our equipment that we might have. Um, noodles are a great opportunity for shadow movement um, but also balancing activities where one child will hold another child's hand and one child will rock back and forth on their feet just on the top of a noodle. It's a great balance activity and it's a great strength activity for the other child. So there are some ways that we can use equipment and we can use space, small space, um, but again it's a matter of rethinking and bringing out those, that creativity to figure out what else can we do with a bean bag and a noodle and a therapy ball besides throw them and catch them. The, when, when teachers are watching children move, uh, often they can see their teachings, their learning style, excuse me, their own learning style coming out in their teaching and the risk and the temperament that a teacher will have 
we often see we have to be real careful in our intentionality of looking at our own teaching and what we're imparting to kids. Because if we are overreactive and, oh, be careful and get down from there, but if we allow kids to take some risks, within reason, but take some risks, um, balancing on the side of a sandbox, climbing backwards up the slide is always a no-no, but what a great strength activity. If we can get kids to climb up and then turn themselves around and slide back down, often that's not allowed, but we see that um, playing on a swing in a different way. Um, so if we can teach kids safety but not overreacting and allowing children to figure it out, just like when a child's learning to walk, if we pick them up every time they fall down, they're not going to learn how to get themselves up and they're not going to learn how to fall down and how to protect themselves if we're constantly protecting them.